Hello, uh, I am Mona and I am a lecturer in Immersive Experience Design at Aberte University. And what I want to do today is look a little bit at how we can use video games to capture, preserve and share her stories. So welcome to She Town. This is where my story begins. As an outsider in Dundee, I'm baffled by the intimate connection that Dundee and video games have. So I start wondering why Dundee of all places? Uh, and of course, I was aware of DMA design. I was, of course, of, uh, aware of Lemmings and, and GTA. Uh, but I also heard this really interesting interview with Chris van der Kyle, where he talks about Timex and the ZX Spectrum computers being manufactured locally and how they fell off the back of the lorry and got into every house in Dundee. And that's what kind of like kick-started uh, Dundee's love story with video games. So that brought me here, right? So this is the Timex factory in Dundee, the Camperdown building, uh, and this was on Harrison Road. Um, and it was here that women assembled ZX81 and ZX Spectrum computers. And these were the first really, really popular public computers. They were sold at half the price that their competition was sold at. So they were retailed at very affordable prices. And that's what made them really exciting, aside from the falling of the back of the lorry thingy. Um, so they were, they were built here by women. So at their heyday, Timex hired more than 5,000 people in Dundee. This was in the 70s, and they started manufacturing the Spectrums in 82. Um, and they would do it here. And out of those 5,000 employees, the majority of them were women. So women were there at the beginning, at the birth of the video games industry. But where are they in the history, and where are they in the industry? So I was really, really kind of curious to see how that kind of transports. Um, I went to visit a site, and at the site, this is all you'll find. So this is a mosaic that was placed there by the mosaic group that works in Douglas. Um, and, and the little uh, memorial plaque there says, Timex Watch Assembly took place here at Camperdown Factory from 1946 till 1983. Um, so Timex was mostly known for watch production. Their kind of subcontracting work for various other uh, developers was never known. So the women also worked for IBM, Nimzo, uh, and Sinclair Research, but that's something that Timex is not known uh, for. Second reason is that if you're from Dundee, you will know this. Timex is synonymous with the Timex strikes. Uh, this is a search that I did earlier this week, right? So all of these results show that um, uh, all of them kind of refer to the Timex strikes. Um, in 1993, after almost five decades of Timex being in the city, but also eight months of really bitter disputes, Timex finally shuts its gates and moves out of Dundee. Um, and that's a moment that is mostly remembered for no, not those nearly five decades of prosperity and, and its impact on the city. So I wanted to kind of go beyond, behind the strikes and look at the things that Timex has done for the city. So I wanted to look at the computers and I wanted to look at the women that built them because that was something that I was really interested in. Um, so I was looking at, uh, at all of these archives, I was interviewing people, but I also wanted to hear it from the horse's mouth as it were. So I interviewed 11 women who worked on the uh, Spectrum assembly lines, um, and I also interviewed eight local developers uh, because I wanted to see from them how they feel the fact that the Timex was manufactured locally actually impacted on their careers and on the industry at large. Um, the interviews with the women were absolutely fantastic. Um, so I was focusing on how the actual assembly of the spectrum took place, so the, the kind of like day-to-day -day processes of assembling the spectrum. But I was also interested in the atmosphere in the Timex. This was a factory where 2,000 women plus worked together. It must have been absolutely mind-blowing. So I was really kind of curious to find out more about that, but also how it felt like living in Dundee at the time. So all of these things were kind of fascinating. And it became apparent very, very quickly um, that to them, Timex was so much more than the strikes, and it was so much more than the computers. To them, Timex was family. To them, it was the bonds that they created, and they kept going for years and years after Timex shot. It was the, the communities they formed, how they helped and supported each other through hardship, um, how they helped each other financially. So they would 
uh, um, bought money together for their baby showers and for their outings and for their weddings. Uh, and they were there for one another. They created alternative structures within the power structures in the Timex. Um, so they, they changed the workplace completely, the fact that they were the mostly women. Uh, so in the toilets, you could do anything from pluck your eyebrows to buy a chandelier to buy your brideys and your arbroth smokies, right? So they ran uh, shops in the toilets. And for anybody who's ever met anybody who's worked in the time, let's just ask them about the toilets and they will tell you. Um, but these stories to me were really fascinating. I was really kind of interested in this really richness of, of, of information in all these archives. So I was wondering what would be the best modes of engagement? What are the best ways of telling these stories? So what I ended up doing, and this was part of my PhD, um, I designed three games, an audio walk. Uh, we ran two workshops of positive picket sign making, um, one in Douglas and one at Hot Chocolate. Um, we had a film projection and also I worked with Alice Mara who ran uh, these uh, three community choirs formed entirely of women who performed Sheena Wellington's Women of Dundee. And all of these came together as a large scale open free for all event that happened, uh, that was called Generation ZXX and it happened on the 4th of May in Camperdown Park. So here we had 300 people who got together uh, to celebrate Dundee's uh, kind of heritage of the ZX Spectrum, the gains that came out of it, and the women who made it all happen. Uh, and I'll just focus on the games. Uh, so the games were installed in this kind of like crazy looking, brightly colored pop-up arcade. This was celebrating all the colors and the personalities of Timex, but also performance and plays kind of like power of subversion. This was set up at the JTC Furniture Group, which is uh, the, the, the um, company that runs their business on site uh, and they gave us permission to assemble this there they gave us access to their facility so everything was quite amazing so it was 25 years after time is shut that we gained access back to the factory so it was the first time for a lot of the women that they crossed those factory gates again um, so it was really really important that it happened there um, the pop-up arcade consisted of those two um, arcade cabinets that you see in the back and those were designed by um, Alice Carnegie and Ursula Chang and were donated by We Throw Switches for this event. So one of the games was set up in there. The other one has its own custom built uh, installation which you can see here at the foreground. And I'm gonna talk a bit about the games just now. Um, so the first two games, Assembly and Cheetown, were designed by a team of third year students as part of their group projects, their students at our day. Um, and uh, the third one, which was called Breaking Out of the Frame, that one was projected directly onto the building. So it's literally played on the Timex building. Um, and that was designed by fellow Aberté Game Lab, um, uh, Neil Moody, Kaylee McLeod, Robin Griffiths, Dana Calloway, um, and myself. Um, and what was really interesting about these games is that each of them engaged with the archive in a different way. And it is here that I really wanted to get that, right? Because um, uh, SheTown, uh, takes advantage of the fact that video games can tell linear stories and they couple spatial progression with narrative progression. So the more you explore of a digital environment, the more you get of the story. You're actually rewarded with it. Uh, the second one tried to do the same thing through gameplay. So um, it, it was trying to capture some of the themes of the archive uh, through, through the actual game and how the game would play. And the third one, more on a symbolic level. So the movement actually captured, um, at, when the crowd moved together, they revealed the hidden stories actually hidden and latent in the site. And I'm gonna get to that in just one second. So SheTown, what happens here? You play as Pinky, which is that little colorful character that you see over there. She's called Pinky because women fondly remember their first time ex uniforms, which were pink, and they refer to themselves as Pinkies. Um, and you explore five levels in the Timex factory, each of them rewarding you with a level of text. So you gather the letters that spell Timex.
because it's such an earworm, and if anybody remembers their old Spectrum and Commodore games, uh, you will know why. So it's kind of recreating that aesthetic. You go, you, you get the T, and then you get a bit of text. And that text was an episode in Sheetown's history. So it was looking at the various um, chapters in Dundee's history um, of, of regeneration and resilience and how we went from um, uh, shipbuilding and whaling to jute to uh, manufacturing and finally to our, our recent creative industries. Um, second game, uh, I said that this one was trying to engage with the same types of stories and, and the archive through gameplay. So what happens here, uh, there's three players and you work on the assembly line. And the way you work on the assembly line is you press the top button to bring your component down from the assembly line to your workstation, and then you press the left button to pass it on along on the assembly line. Um, and you try to build as many ZX Spectrums as you can. Um, now, this was kind of like recreating the monotony and the repetitiveness of the work, uh, but also exactly that monotony and repetitiveness is what encourages you to develop the camaraderie and the sisterhood and, and, and all of those uh, conviviality that I was talking about and the playfulness. Uh, just to kind of like give you an idea of how it actually works. So it's also recreating the, the kind of like dependency that happens on an assembly line. Yeah. So if the first player doesn't pass anything on to the second player, then the second player can't do anything and they don't do their rota. Um, and finally, the third game, this was crowd controlled. So everybody moves together. Uh, to get Pinky to get as many ZX Spectrums as she can. And then she gathers them. Um, you will see that she reveals one third of the screen. And these are the same chapters in the history of SheTown, but in a visual form. So we had these gorgeous uh, visuals created by Kaylee McLeod. Um, And this is just to give you kind of like a quick taster of how they look like. And this is like cheeky self-promotion from last week when we showed the game uh, here at the VNA. and um, But mostly to kind of like leave you with something is like I really want you to kind of start and share my enthusiasm for the numerous, numerous things that video games can do for oral histories and how they can capture the beauty of lived experience through gameplay. Thank you. <laughs>